So you are in for a real treat uh, this evening. I am blessed to be able to welcome Angela Nagel to Virtual Futures. My name is Luke Robert Mason, and I'm the director of Virtual Futures. And you can follow the conversation tonight on the hashtag uh, VF Salon. So, for those of you who are here for the first time, the Virtual Futures Conference occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid-90s. And to quote its co-founder, it arose at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Now, whilst it was most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as The Guardian put it, its actual aim hidden behind the brush still, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs and charismatic profits was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did, or at least tried to do, was cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. This Salon series completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. Tonight, we're joined by author and journalist Angela Nagel. Her new book, Kill All Normies, is a complex text because it deals with an ever-moving target, the nature of the web since uh, 2000. It is a book that's been the subject of multiple unofficial rewritings by the online communities it documents. Some aspects have been amplified, others have been completely ignored. And this, is a cha and this is the challenge of writing about the culture wars. They are still occurring. Multiple battles play out online with very little hope that anyone will actually come out on top. Least of all, Western society. On the one side, the alt-right, the neo-reactionaries and the white supremacist movements who occupy the discussion boards on platforms like 4chan. And on the other side, the social justice warriors that engage in virtual signaling who demand trigger warnings and need safe spaces. I'm sure it is a book that the author secretly hopes will age terribly, insofar as we might look back on this funny little period of history and dismiss it as just a fad. The alternative is much more terrifying. So, to help the normies among us understand the wired and wonderful subcultures located in the corners of the web, please put your hands together and join me in welcoming Angela Nagel to the Virtual Futures stage. Have you got, is, have you got I fans know, there? Know about there. Yeah, I know. All right, okay. You, you, you brought your very own fan club. So, <laughs> Angela, we have to get every speaker a fan club. Um, I'm going to start here, normies. So, uh, for, this, this, for the normies in the room, what are normies and, and why should they be killed? <laughs> um, well, uh, I guess uh, the way that the term is used, um, you know, obviously book is not suggesting that <laughs> the way the term is used I guess just means um people who don't understand uh online culture um who are uh you know who don't understand the politics of uh the different kind of subcultures warring with each other online and particularly um those who don't understand the more right-leaning kind of political subcultures so where did all this start so it started with tumblr versus 4chan at least is that's the sort of starting point that you put out in the book well i mean it's it's not actually the starting point like you know um because people are very precious about the subcultures that they belong to um a lot of people were very uh, pedantic about that point were saying oh you should have said it was live journal instead of tumblr but i should just say i'm not saying like this is the absolute starting point in either case i'm just saying you know you have to, in some way, when you're writing about something that is, is, is like a moving target, as you say, you have to find some kind of a phrase that basically captures the spirit of something. And that was more what those terms were about. So, I mean, 4chan did kind of capture the, the humor and the kind of sensibility of the alt-right uh, online. And, and Tumblr is the the kind of platform that I would most associate with the other side. So they're very broad brushstrokes kind of ways of 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 loosely categorizing, 
you know, a, a, a set of political s online subcultures and stuff like that. So, so before we really jump into the crux of the book, you look at how this all started, and it started in 2010. And in 2010, it was a very cyber utopian moment. Yeah, I mean, uh, because I was actually studying, at the time I was starting to look into a lot of this stuff. Uh, primarily it was the the, the, the more like the anti-feminist kind of uh, forums and stuff online that I was looking at. And I was seeing lots of really, really dark stuff kind of emerging. But then when I would look at the paper or look at what other people that I knew kind of who were on the left were talking about and, and you know, even, yeah, what was in the news, everyone at the time you know, there was this kind of cyber utopian fervor. It was very much around that period, all about the Arab Spring, um, the demonstrations in Spain, the Occupy movement. So, you know, sort of suddenly there was like almost like a domino effect, loads and loads of huge public square protests all over the world. And many of them or most of them seemed to be organized online. Um, things like hashtag campaigns were kind of relatively, you know, novel at the time. Now they're kind of all over the place. So, you know, they're not that interesting to us anymore. But at the time, it kind of felt like everyone was trying to get their heads around what was happening. And the common factor, you know, many kind of commentators felt was the fact that they they were younger people who had organized everything instantaneously online and that they kind of bypassed a lot of older forms of politics. Now, um, uh, you know, I mean, the, and I, I, I kind of admire people who, who, who make these big predictions. Like Paul Mason was one of the people who, who made the really big predictions. And I kind of admire that in a way, even though I disagree with him, because you are taking a massive risk, when, especially when it's something really utopian and positive, because you'll look ridiculous if you get it wrong. And, um, uh, and you know, but he, you know, yeah, he, he pretty much put it out there and just said, you know, that he felt this was like, um, he described it as like, um, handbrake turn for humanity and uh, this was going to just um, you know completely make make hierarchies a thing of the past political parties you know old-fashioned political parties uh, you know all, all that kind of stuff um, I remember one particular thing he said which was um, the left would no longer be the um, a place where you would find the gatekeepers of subversive knowledge was the phrase he used. And now, I mean, if you look like uh, today, you know, that's true. But <laughs> it turned out to be the far right who ended up, uh, you know, capitalizing on all these things and, and being the, the, you know, the, the place where kind of subversive knowledge was found, not just the far right, but say info wars, you know, uh, and everything else. So why, why do you think the left's anti-establishment dream failed? Um, Insofar as what Paul Mason was saying was was this kind of cyber utopia moment, it was a hope that what the left really wanted from the web was about to happen, and and yet what we see in the book is it got co-opted. Was it the fact that the right had better memes? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I guess it's more the fact that um, uh maybe it was an attempt to bypass very old problems through technology, like thinking that you could, you would not have to deal with uh, all these kind of old political problems and, you know, moral questions and philosophical questions, and that now technology would just allow, you know, you to, to, to leapfrog all of that. So there was kind of a, a, a naivety or a hope in that. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was kind of misplaced because it was very much style over substance, you know, and, and what I think has been shown since is that um, just about any politics can kind of fill that void as long as it's sort of anti-establishment, um, you know, the, it doesn't have to be, you know, all these writers kind of assumed that, that you know, if, if, if everyone got a platform and if everyone was their own publisher and everyone had access to social media and so on, that everyone would, would move to the left. And that, that's not how it, how it happened. Do, do you think it was, it was something to do with the, the fact that even though there's countercultures on both the left and the right, the right became really effective in capturing the mimetic power of the internet? Do you, I joke to a degree, but do you think it is because they really understood the aesthetics of meme culture or are we giving meme culture too much credit for the rise of the right? Mm. 
Um, I mean, it's it's kind of you have to go to some extent with intuition because it's impossible to really measure something like that. But it definitely does feel like uh, um, maybe they were better placed, you know, to be an anti-establishment kind of force online because um, uh, I guess some kind of, uh, you know, liberal politics has kind of become hegemonic, really. And um, and so um, it, it's not that surprising that, you know, something that, uh, you know, that when the culture war is kind of kicked off online, that, that, that it was going to be the right who was going to be more irreverent and funny and, um, you know, uh, kind of having fun being insensitive and, and, uh, uh, kind of reveling in like, uh, offending people and stuff like that. It, it sort of, uh, it, it makes sense that it would be them rather than the left. I mean, how does detached irony because it is that the weird thing about meme culture especially on the right is is this weird detached irony and it's mockery and it's this very sort of dark humor that emerges how do you think they capture the zeitgeist there because really i mean a lot of these memes are devoid of real politics aren't they well i mean there's always some kind of politics to it i guess it's more um like i was saying uh, to a friend recently uh i increasingly feel that um i increasingly feel that zizek is like the godfather of all of like internet politics basically like among millennials because if you think of the the you know when he became like a huge celebrity kind of among younger people he would often be filmed with like a picture of Stalin in the background or something like that. And his whole sense of humor was very much about, um, you know, playfully kind of flirting with, um, you know, taboo kind of um, uh, politics, basically. And always leaving out there the possibility that like, I might be joking, but I might not be joking, kind of. And that's very much the sense of humor, you know, of, well, I think, the funny bits of the right and the left online, actually, but, you know, you do like, there is that weird kind of flirtation with stuff where you don't really know if the person really means what they're, what they're presenting to you, you know, but I guess within that, the, the ironists and the people who actually meant it were all kind of mixed up together. So whilst the, the right was getting, uh, interested in meme culture, the left was getting off track. At least that's the narrative that you tell in this book. And the left went down the road of engaging in online shaming and their culture war was really around virtue signaling. Could you explain what happened there? Yeah, um, I mean, um, you know, I hate to say the left in a way because, you know, anyone who's kind of experienced this stuff you know, over the years kind of knows that a lot of the time the primary targets of it were people on the left themselves who, you know, had slightly, um, you know, said the wrong thing or had the, you know, a dissenting view on one issue or another. Um, so it was very much about an internal policing kind of, um, uh, mainly on culture wars kind of issues, you know, I mean, people were not being called out for having the wrong, um, you know, opinion on uh, uh, like tax or something like that. You know what I mean? It was always the cultural stuff. And um, and essentially, yeah, the, the uh, um, at the same time that the right was kind of finding its own style and its kind of funny sense of humor and um, was developing this very effective kind of... Um, you know, online, well, propaganda culture, basically. Um, uh, at the same time, uh, that kind of cultural left was becoming um, a, a very scolding and kind of um, humorless and, uh, you know, just very off-putting for a lot of people. Um, and it became uh, a, a culture in which it was kind of... Um, really just impossible to to have any sense of humor or you know uh it it was it was the opposite basically to the direction that the the right was going in where they then got to be the fun place that you could go and kind of say anything do you think that's partly because of the bias of the digital tools that both sides are being given the 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 feed with regards to twitter and facebook do you think there's something innate in the design of these digital tools that 
encourages this sort of engagement, this sort of uh, interaction. Definitely. I mean, if you think of actually the big divide is almost almost as significant of, as the right left one is actually the anonymous uh, Internet versus, uh, you know, the the um, de-anonymized one or the, the one where, uh, you know, your 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 identity is is um, on display, because once your identity is on display, you're you're a part of you, you're engaging in a kind of a daily ritual of basically branding yourself. And, you know, you know, if you lose use any kind of social media platform, one of the first things you're asked to do is to describe yourself. Um, and I actually think, you know, if you think of imagine, say, your grandparents, you know, describing themselves, they would just find that embarrassing, you know, because it's so vain, <laughs> you know, like I'm such a whatever, like I'm this kind of person. It's 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 just something that is kind of really distasteful or something, but it, it has been normalized. So that um, people who've grown up online are just used to this constant practice of, you know, y y like uh, uh, detagging yourself in uh, unflattering photos, you know, building up this constant brand of this is the kind of, you know, these are the kind of places I go. This is the kind of music I listen to. This is the kind of person I am. You're just every day doing that. So obviously in that context, it really matters that you that part of that branding is that you can show that you are a virtuous person. Um, whereas if you are anonymous, the whole point is to be the opposite to that. The whole point is to say the things you can't say elsewhere, to say the most taboo things you can think of, uh, to be like, um, uh, uh, you know, a um, kind of taboo breaking and all that stuff. So I think that definitely is. And of course, you know, the, 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 the platform or the, the, the form of 4chan is anonymous. So, um, it's almost in, inviting people to, um, to dwell on the things that are taboo elsewhere in the online world and in real life. Well, let's talk a little bit about anonymity and authenticity in digital platforms. Do you think there's something important about anonymity do you think there's the original well and and these original platforms built in the 90s the most wonderful thing about them is people could try on different identities mm -hmm. they were judged on the character of what they said and they could create new personas that were divorced from the individual they were behind the screen and do you think there's something cathartic about the ability to have anonymity do you think it's actually potentially a positivist thing, even though it may cause individuals to say the nastiest things, mm -hmm. do you think it's good to a degree for people to be allowed to do that, mm -hmm. to exorcise that? I don't know. I mean, that's kind of the biggest question in all of this because it goes to the heart of um, the role of taboos in culture, basically, you know, like, uh, so when people speak anonymously, um, you know, as Oscar Wilde would have it, you know, with a mask, they're saying what they really think. Mm -hmm. But then it brings up the question, like, do we really want to know what people really think? Mm -hmm. Like, is there actually some value in having to restrain some of the things that you think? Um, I mean, you know, the, the, there's a whole range of different, uh, you know, ways of viewing kind of the the what taboo is doing and um and i think maybe we kind of inherit the very um well the 60s i suppose the, the countercultural kind of attitude which is that repression is really is is a very negative thing and you need to kind of let it all hang out and say whatever you really think um but uh what we see is that when people do that it's actually pr pretty <laughs> ugly you know and um and uh, it, it's really given, you know, that those are the kind of big questions that it's led me to because I don't know the answer. I mean, it's very hard to make the case for saying, yes, we should have more repression. And we, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but I don't know. I mean, um, uh, are there, are there, yeah, I think there probably are taboos that should be just regulated naturally in the culture. People are socialized all, I mean, the part of like not being feral is that you're just, you're socialized into appropriate ways of behaving and stuff like that so that we don't all kill each other. And, uh, you know, uh, I would basically take the Freudian view that the, that these taboos are the absolute 
uh, fabric of uh, civilization and that they're very important to, um, uh, to to people behaving morally, I guess. Um, so I don't know, but I'm I'm almost more leaning in the direction of saying I actually don't value anonymity very much. In some cases, you could you could make a stronger case for it, particularly um, for you know if you're living under an authoritarian regime or something like that, and it's it's just a case of getting information out there or whatever. Um, but the general practice of just um, uh, having no kind of limits and having, you know, no constraints of, like, uh, sensitivity towards others, uh, you know, that isn't great either. There was a Zero Books video essay looking at your your book that made a distinction or made a claim that perhaps this rise of transgression in society has something to do with the death of God. In other words, if we have no, as human individuals have no uh, entity looking over them, you know, controlling their actions in hope that, you know, when they finally get off this planet in 85 to 90 years, there's something else better because you lived a good life on Earth. And now we've had this death of God. We live in this very secular society. We feel like we can transgress. There is no, you know, big guy in the sky who's sort of looking over us, controlling us in a way in which it keeps us on a very specific moral track. Mm. How do you think a lot of this sort of way of being has come about? Is it partly to do with that? Or is there something else happening in society which is allowing individuals to feel like they can transgress in ways they haven't before? Mm. Well, I mean, I guess you could say, like, (laughs) certainly some of the, the kind of stuff that I've read suggests that violence in general in society is declining. So it's not that people are just getting nastier in general. It's more that m- perhaps the violence that w- might have been um, expressed, you know, uh, physically and out in the world is now being channeled into these spaces. I mean, uh, you know, that's a possibility. I mean, the 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 death of God stuff is, you know, I, it does undermine the, the the basics of like rights, for example, right? So one of the big the biggest fights that goes on uh, in the online culture wars is about freedom of speech. Mm. And when people make the case for freedom of speech, in a way they are kind of speaking a dead language because what they're talking about is an inalienable right. But the only reason it was ever that was that it was supposed to be rooted in the idea of God. Uh, God, you, you derived your rights from God. Um, and once that's gone, then it kind of doesn't really make that much sense anymore. Um, because then you have to try to make the case for, so if you want to make the case for something like free speech, you have to do it on the grounds of, um, you know, that it will have beneficial outcomes like, you know, and the enlightenment idea will, 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 the best argument will prevail and all that kind of stuff. But you cannot make the case really for rights in, in a way that used to be, you know, rooted in in uh, God, because, of course, everyone now is brought up pretty secular. Um, so, I mean, I definitely think of that a lot. I, I don't I don't think that it's the case that it's destroying uh, sort of, you know, moral behavior or something like that yet, uh, certainly. But I do think that that it's there in the background and it has there. It, it, it's more like it's it's definitely influenced it, it's created a, a sort of nihilistic culture in a way. I mean, that's a really, you know, um, well, that's something conservatives always said. But I mean, if, if you can't believe in God, then there's no, there's nothing you can do about it. You just have to, you just have to, but you can still observe it and say this is happening. It's just that the you don't necessarily think the answer is to go back to the church or something like that. Do you think that there's this underlying nihilistic tendency that's bubbling up inside of the last seven to 10 years within culture? And and if so, why have we become so nihilistic? Why have the, whether you want to call them millennial generation or something else, why do they feel like there is no future? Um, okay, well, I think part of it is a material thing. Like we know, for example, that uh, the 
standards of living of millennials is will get worse than than their parents. So things will actually go downhill for the first time in a very long time. Um, and the whole idea of, um, you know, progress and modernity is that things get better all the time. Um, you know, you you um, the all kinds of things get worse in ways, right? So you lose religion, spirituality, faith, you lose community, you lose uh, all, you know, <laughs> smaller cultures are sort of wiped out and everyone, you know, everyone will sound like they're from California and mm. about 10 years probably or less. Um, and all of that stuff happens and you, you know, national identities are probably going to be destroyed as well. Um, and all of that stuff gets flattened. But the one thing you do get is, material progress everything gets better and that's that's stopped so uh, or it feels like it's stopped i mean we know that in the poorest parts of the world you know in lots of measurements that i've seen things are getting better but certainly if you're in the west uh, and if you're young it doesn't feel that way uh, so part of it is the the lack of hope uh, uh, for the future is actually just based in people's experience of life um and um uh, and I think also, yeah, the the it it is also the fact that people don't feel that there's anything beyond their own life. Like, uh, you know, why bother building anything for the future if you're not going to be around to see it anyway? Um, but I mean, that is one of the things that the alt right often say. Like that, uh, people say to them, "Well, why do you care what happens after you die? You won't be there, so it doesn't matter." Um, and um, uh, and that is definitely pretty uh, widespread. But I mean, also, um, I wrote a piece uh, on kind of 4chan and trolling and irony and all this stuff uh, with uh, a, a co-author, Jacob Siegel. And um, one of the things we were talking about it in it is in, in that culture is that basically, you know, the most nihilistic culture, the, the culture that brought that to the absolute extreme was the culture of 4chan. But and that's why it was people who were who were in that culture all the time who were the first to try to um, almost have like a well like a Weimar Republic sort of like a counter reaction to it because they almost could see like this is the way the future is going to the future is going to be nihilistic you know we've seen the kind of darkest depths of of the internet and of what freedom gives you and it's it's actually a, a terrible thing and 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 there was this like reaction against it which became you know well reactionary but uh, um you know uh, m interested in the the distant past and you know trying to um completely reject modern society basically in some cases do you think these people actually believe this stuff or do you think there's a degree of nihilistic performance art that's occurring? Well, some of them definitely believe it. Um, I think some, uh, you know, I mean, if you if you if you spend every day of your life for several years looking at, um, you know, um, I guess kind of. Uh, homemade propaganda or whatever, you know, uh, really terrifying stuff about how, you know, the, um, the, the, uh, people are going to, you know, like Muslim immigrants from the suburbs are going to come in and kill everyone or whatever. You know, if you're thinking about that stuff every day, uh, I mean, yeah, you do start, you would believe it. I, I, I think they do believe it. And, uh, they, they, I think they do believe that they, um, that, that this is a sort of basically inevitable, uh, future. How do these people get like this? I mean, you've written a little bit about... No, look, but uh, for, uh, from a serious perspective, you've written a little bit about your concern over this usually white men who feel, to a degree, disenfranchised, and you haven't quite gone as far as said we should have sympathy for men on the alt-right, but there is a reason as to why they have this anger and frustration in them. And you cover a little bit of that in the book and you have in your recent article. I wonder if you could just share your thoughts on perhaps the actual trauma that might be underlying a lot of this expression on the web. Uh, well, I guess, I mean, it is uh, kind of like the the millennial thing. I mean, it is part, partly a uh, sense of a loss of power 
which is based in something real. I mean, uh, you know, uh, and um, it's a loss of power and then uh, mixed with a lot of... Uh, w- well, actually, in many ways, it's actually a loss of power in the culture rather than really in um, in the real world or in the in, in the material world. I mean, uh, you know, sort of white men still dominate kind of all the the high ranking positions in in just about every kind of elite field you can think of uh, in the Western world. But uh, but if you are not one of those people and you're just a regular like you know teenage guy or whatever and you're immersed in the online culture wars, you're probably seeing every single day somebody telling you that you're just like an evil person um, and that you should feel really bad about uh, who you are. And, you know, that some people obviously don't like being told that. And they, you know, it's and they at some point start to um, get very angry and resentful about it. You, you talk about... When it comes to hatred and, and mockery of men, it's sometimes more socially acceptable. And then these, uh, you describe them as beta males, or you have described them in the past as beta males, they take that, they internalize that, and there's certain long term effects that come with that, aren't there? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I guess one of the big uh, changes actually since I wrote the book uh, maybe is uh, the, you know, like so, uh, it's about a year and a half ago or something like that. I wrote this piece for the Baffler about the 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 beta male thing on, and you know the the funny kind of self deprecating thing of calling yourself one, you know. And uh, but uh, then the real, you know, then there was this whole idea of chads, you know, and um, uh, and actually when the um, when the, the, the well the, the Charlottesville uh, event but the, the the first night where they had the torches and everything like the guys who were at that were were chads you know like that the, it was like chad nationalism became real you know <laughs> because it wasn't like geeky internet guys you know uh, they were all quite butch and they were all dressed in uniform and um, they almost looked like military guys and um, so the so actually uh two things have kind of gone out of date since I have written the book, even though it's only a few months old. One of them is that that, well, the, the, the extent to which the, 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 the chads have become, you know, very much the forefront in all of this. Um, and the other one also is that while normie is still used as a pejorative, some of the time, uh, most of the time, probably I do see it more often now or yeah, more commonly used uh, in kind of conversations about like how can we bring in the normies? How can we convert the normies? Mm. Uh, and so it's it's a bit less anti-normie than it used to be. There's a lot more talk of like we have like uh, I saw one conversation, for example, after Charlottesville, where they were saying like um, uh, you know we can't go around saying that we want a white ethno state. We have to like find ways to. Uh, conceal it you know because we have to we don't want to scare off the normies do you think that uh, to a degree the the dressing up and the costuming of these individuals it, it, again it feels like there's something performative about it there feels there's something theatrical about it which makes it to a degree slightly disingenuous or are they trying to create a degree of performance so that they have something again to hide behind a layer of a layer that they can sit there and go, look, you know, well, it's not exactly what we meant. It was purely a, a play. It was mm-hmm. purely playing in, in the streets. Mm-hmm. Do you think there's an element of that? Are they trying to protect themselves? They're, they're not, when they are out in the streets, they're not fully saying what they believe, I don't think. Uh, well, I mean, I guess it's like the the attraction is to is to subcultures because you're signaling your belonging to a subculture when you, you know, dress the same as the other people in that group and, and stuff like that. And you're, 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 you know, I mean, political movements have always understood the power of uniform, you know, it's, it suggests uniformity of purpose, uh, you know, and, um, 
a, a group solidarity and stuff like that. So I don't think that the playfulness of it necessarily means that they don't mean it or anything like that. I mean, I think they do. It, certainly if you're actually out in the real world joining an, an alt-right demonstration where anyone can take a photo of your face and dox you, you know, you, you really do mean it at that point. You'd be crazy to put yourself in that level of danger uh, and not mean it. Well, do you think then it's, it's the fact that we're being told in this, uh, since the turn of the 2000s, that these tools are going to allow us to create our own identities, to become individuals, but then that's not what we actually crave. What we really crave as human beings is a sense of community. Mm -hmm. And we're realizing that maybe social media and the networks aren't giving us that community feeling that's the same as being with a group of, let's just say 150 people because it's the Dunbar number, actually with physical people and physical real space. Is there a sudden realization of that? And a very um, heightened feeling of alienation on the web and not community? Yeah, I mean, again, going back to the kind of that, that uh, cyber utopian sort of moment, um, uh, around the time of, of all of those protests. Um, one of the things that was brought back up and kind of talked about a bit by, by Paul Mason and others was this idea of uh, the networked individual. So uh, before that, like uh, communitarians kind of talked about the decline of, of community and, uh, um, you know, bowling alone and all that stuff. And the then the next idea was okay, community is broken down, all social institutions have broken down, the church, the family, trade unions, uh, bowling clubs, like every every form of like social bond is sort of broken down and people are individuals. But now we have the internet, you can be a networked individual. So you can have hundreds of friends and you can be constantly plugged into like, you know, being intimate with other people, you know, and being kind of, yeah, having, having a, a social world without having to actually leave your room. Um... But yeah, that has obviously proven to, well, on the one hand, you could say it's proven to not give people enough, uh, you know, but on the other hand, it is also really created these subcultures where people clearly do feel some bond with each other. Um, so, so it has kind of done both. But I think the bigger backdrop to that maybe is that um, I definitely feel like the arguments being made by those making the case for individualism against the collectivisms of the left and the right, I think are really weak. Uh, I mean, they, 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 they are, I don't think they are strong enough to really hold up against either side. Um, and, uh, I think it's just because, um, you know, it's obvious if you are again, a millennial, you know, you're, you're, you're in a way the product of an individualism of the right and the left. So you have the individualism of the right coming from kind of Thatcherism. Uh, you know, there's no such thing as society and all that. Uh, and But you also have the individualism of the cultural left, which is very much about um, uh, expressing yourself, you know, being the real you and like, you know, um, being, uh, being free and all that kind of stuff. And you know, the, the, the boring old collectivism of the old left became very unattractive to people during those kind of boom uh, years. Uh, so like the 90s was the real moment of of fusion between the two, uh, this weird like fusion of, of like, well, Richard Barbrook uh, talked about as the Californian ideology. So like corporate culture and sort of counterculture and individualism and a weird kind of le like liberal Thatcherism or whatever you want to call it. Um, the, I think that now, if you're around now, you know that the, 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 the problems that you face are a product of years of that. So, you know, if you go for long enough when trade unions are as weak as they have been, you know, surprise, surprise, you're going to have terrible, uh, precarious, badly paid, uh, you know, work. Um, and you're going to be paying massive fees to go to college and you'll come out with loads of debt and have no job prospects. Um, and uh, so I think in different ways, lot, like people are thinking about the same problem and reaching different conclusions. Um, but, the, but the problem that I think, you know, smart kind of 
people of that generation are thinking about is the idea that basically individualism has actually let us down and is and has resulted in you know in nihilism and in a total lack of meaning and uh, and you know the big question is sort of like how do you rebuild that um and you know the answer that the old right is kind of coming to is very much along the lines of of race basically uh and uh, and at the very least of nation um uh, but but the that i think that is kind of like the the backdrop of it certainly that that sort of the 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 fact that younger people are figuring out that that individualism has uh you know not delivered certain things well let's talk about how the left are dealing with this ability to construct brand new identities because it feels like what they do is they hunker down into those identities and what we have is bleeding onto college campuses around the US and it's the phenomena of identity politics and the social justice warrior, the SJW. These people are very protectionist of these identities that in a large degree they've constructed for themselves and how has that come to pass? Um. I don't know. <laughs> I don't. Well, it just has. I don't know why exactly. Um, I mean, I guess. Uh, uh, well, how? Um, uh, well, more specifically, how has it happened in the U.S. and yet in Europe, we haven't quite seen it to the degree we have in the U.S. So we've seen the the protests at Berkeley, but we haven't seen anything happen that's similar at U.K. institutions just. Yet, I mean, some British academics argue it's because our undergraduate students never read the actual pre-work, so they don't actually know what they're fighting against, whereas, which is a real issue. But in the in the US, we see it, but in Europe, less so. And do you think there's a fundamental difference between the mindset of individuals from America, where, you know, and Americans, and the, the, I've heard American friends of mine describe themselves or self-identify themselves as mutts. You know, they have no history, and therefore they create a future for themselves, an identity for themselves that's based on this collective collecting of multiple parts of their background and their their racial history or their or their family history based on what they have once they hit the US it's a 300 year old country whereas mm -hmm. Europe is a much more kind of established uh, entity where we've got a great degree of diversity and a great degree of history do you think that there's that's the reason for it or is there something else about an american mindset that has given rise to this thing called the SJW uh, yeah, I, it probably is an American. Well, I mean, yeah, there's definitely the search for identity that's very powerful. Um, and, you know, I think that if, if you're, if, if you're from elsewhere, um, you might kind of take for granted your identity in a way. So it's not as meaningful, uh, to you, or you're not maybe as sensitive about it. Um, and you know, you do have, I guess, the breakdown of identities. Um, you know, if you think about the the um, you know the descendants of the kind of European, like the Ellis Island kind of period of migration into America. I mean, they're you know, I often think of the the Sopranos, like AJ, sort of like you know, if you, you, when you're so many generations on, you don't you can't really identify yourself as you know an Italian American or a Irish American or whatever, you're just a white American. And so therefore, I don't know, you have to find identities elsewhere or kind of, um, you know, construct them elsewhere. Um, also, I mean, um, uh, what, I mean, what other identities would people have in a way? Like, um, you know, it's seen as very sort of, at the very least, uh, sort of kind of naff, if not like sinister, to have a, a national identity, you know what I mean, to be like patriotic. And so like, and young people are certainly not going to want to be, you know, uh, seen in that way, or, or you know, they're, they're not gonna have any positive association with that. So, so what else, you know, I mean, y you have to kind of find identity somewhere. And, um, but you know, identity is very, very important to people. And, uh, I certainly wouldn't, although I, I've used kind of identity politics as a shorthand for a certain type of style of politics that we have now, I don't dismiss identity politics altogether because I just think identity identity is such a uh, ever-present kind of like component in all politics. Um, it, it's just that it's fractured and new now because 
the old identities no longer really make any sense. But what happens when these these social justice warriors collide with the ability to have freedom of speech? Mm. I mean, there's something else going on there which is culturally very problematic. Mm. Well, I think it does have to do with the what I was saying about the 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 um the hollowing out of the the root of rights um which is based in religion and uh and and so the making the case for for these rights that I think that the they hear that language and they just it just doesn't make any sense to them they just say but we but what if the outcome of this is negative why do we why why are these inalienable you know that and because it is a kind of a as i say a slightly outdated language that go, that that was you know made sense when people believed in god and stuff like that um but so the rights thing the you know the 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 idea of rights uh doesn't quite make sense anymore now we just think of rights as things that are in a constitution or like things that are given to you by the state and we don't quite know why the the are, are, we think they're given to us by the state because they're good you know and that's not really anything like what what rights were originally conceived as so so um you know so when the speech rights issue um you know happens i mean another huge problem is that i think that the people who tend to be most in favor of speech rights are usually people who know they're likely to gain from the their expression of that you know so i think everyone's kind of a bit of a hypocrite on the on the speech issue because very few people you know uh very few people say you know defend uh, free speech rights when they know they're going to lose if those you know are actually exercised so i think at the moment um the a lot of kind of uh liberal ideas have been unchallenged for so long that people don't really know why they believe them anymore they're just sort of in the air and so when they get challenged by people who have been you know nerding up online for years and like you know reading about all this kind of crazy stuff that nobody else has really even been thinking about uh you're really taken aback by it i mean it's almost like if you speak to anyone who is a conspiracy theorist who spends a lot of time online you will not be able to win an argument with them because they will have read more than you are ever going to read on the subject and at a certain point you have to say let's say it's about chemtrails in the sky or something like that they'll say um you know you just believe that because you've been told to, that that this is a conspiracy and he, bum 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 here's my 20 articles that you have to now read about chemtrails and at a certain point you have to go actually I'm too lazy to read these and uh, and basically the only reason that I don't believe in this is because I just sort of have a vague sense that if this was happening someone would have uncovered it someone reputable would have uncovered it at some point. That's incredibly lazy and really shaky <laughs> grounds on which to base. But the thing is you cannot you simply there there are not there are not enough hours in the day to go chasing up every conspiracy theory that's out there. Um but you know there is also a connection between the dole and conspiracy theories because obviously people are on the dole of loads of time to spend <laughs> online uh and this is like a, a sort of a you know like a running joke in sort of uh you know 4chan and like alt right uh, forums and stuff like that because you know there is this idea that you can become this kind of brilliant expert by just being on the dole and just uh, and just researching 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 all the time um and i i remember one time when i was on the dole uh the the there was a, some of the other people in the room we had to go to one of these humiliating things where they show you how to write a cv when you're 30 or something like that and uh th when the 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 instructor was out of the room most of the people in the room were normies if you like right like they were kind of very normal people uh and some of them were like my mother's age or uh or somewhere between uh, uh me and my mother and uh they all believed in conspiracies and they all spoke um in a very knowledgeable lengthy detailed way about 9/11 the moon landing um all of them like you know and uh, it was just absolutely bizarre to see these like really normal people like saying but i'm convinced it's because they had spent time on the dole and they just like 
you know, went down a rabbit hole basically and <laughs> thought, oh my God, the, I've been lied to my whole life and I've just discovered the truth, which is the whole red pill thing. Hey, so, so ultimately jobs won't just fix the economy, but they could also fix culture <laughs> and society. There's the cyberpunk novelist Pat Cadigan who says, look, if it exists, there's somebody somewhere that's neurotic about it. And there's an element of neurosis, is there not, about how they perceive and re-engineer the smallest pieces of information. I mean, the more culturally aware argument is the, the Netflix documentary Ancient Aliens. I mean, we all know it's rubbish. We all know it's absolute Do bollocks. Do we, though? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but That's the one I do believe in. <laughs> really? Oh, fuck. Um, yeah. But I. Uh, but I mean, it's it's you. You can make any piece of information fulfill any outcome with enough intensity, and there is this kind of drive to keep everybody confused. And in a way, do you think this mass confusion is the? ultimate control mechanisms. All these people are supposed to be anti-establishment, but in actual fact, do you think the establishment's laughing them behind their back, going, let's keep them confused, let's keep them fighting? The stuff that Steve Bannon was saying about the best thing that could happen are these identity uh, uh, culture wars, because that keeps them focused on the wrong issues. Mm -hmm. Do you think we have not politicized, but depoliticized, and we're arguing about the dumb shit? Mm. Yeah, very possibly. I mean, the... the um you know, economics is boring and uh, the real kind of decisions that are made that will affect everyone's lives are maybe too complicated for most of us to actually understand or they're so technical at this point that uh, they're all just being made in, in private, basically, among kind of experts. And, um, and, and meanwhile, we're, yeah, battling it out constantly. You know, I mean... <laughs> It, it is, the, you know, a, a, the, the more time you spend online, you are generating profit, like, you know, I mean, uh, and having people constantly obsessively online all the time and having these battles day in, day out, this hamster wheel of sort of outrage that goes on every single day on social media. Uh, yeah, I think it probably does distract from kind of more important things. But then also, I mean, the idea that, you know, it's not just people on the dole who, who believe in conspiracies, like the the mainstream liberal establishment in America, you know, thinks that Russia is like ruling every country in the world now at this point and fi fixing all the elections. And like, what on earth is this? I just cannot believe that this is happening. Like, um, and that is a crazy conspiracy. I really believe, uh, you know, I'm sure there are hackers in every country in the world you know, I'm sure you could find little bits, like every conspiracy, you can find little bits of truth in it somewhere. But uh, it just does not add up that a country with an economy the size of probably one American state is controlling everything. Um, similarly, on the right, they believe that Israel is controlling everything. Uh, and I think it doesn't make sense for the same reason. So on that note, we're going to open up for questions so uh we are going to hand out a mic and is there any burning questions at this point in time yeah, yeah just at the back could you run that cheers buddy oh could you someone run it someone run with it <laughs> move with it so we can grab it off people if we need to um could you sorry buddy could you go with the mic could you go with the mic just in case we have to no he's got the mic just just so you can uh, it's on. It is. It is. Okay. Um, you mentioned trade unions a couple of times, and that's great. I'm a trade unionist. I'm from the RMT. And um, I wanted to ask you, in the talking about identities, if you think it's possible to create a positive identity for millennials as workers. Um, one of the things that you touched on, you asked why you don't see identity politics so much in Europe. And I think that's because there's actually still... Uh, the labour movement, which holds what most people to be uh, considered the correct position uh, between a capitalist state fighting against a, a general class-based movement. And that's generally where even our positions on like rights of women who are new to the workforce in the 20th century, black workers who are new to the workforce, new to the country in the 20th century in this country, most of those rights were enshrined via the struggle of uh, the organised class. 
So yeah, so I've, I throw the question because rather than the left trying to fight incessantly against identity politics, which actually doesn't come from the left rather than liberal academia, is there a chance that perhaps the left could fight for positive identities, but based on material things, uh, to use the dirty word class? <laughs> Will I d just wait for a few or just ask, answer one at a time? No, just the okay. first one. Thank you, Maria. Um, Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, I, but I think, uh, like, maybe to some extent that's already happening. Like, I do think that um, uh, that kind of sense that, uh, particularly among kind of younger people who are uh, in uh, unstable and, uh, you know, precarious work and stuff like that, I think younger people are starting to, th they're kind of um, getting over this idea that, you know, it, like if you're not like a chimney sweep, you're you must be middle class, you know, um, and uh, the and that's kind of an identity thing, right? Because you're you're identifying uh, your role in the economy and your relation to um, your boss, I guess. Uh, but uh, yeah, it definitely could be um, an identity in a way, or that that you know those kind of positive ident identities could be created um, because I do think that. Sometimes in the discussion about identity politics, when I hear people who I am generally politically sympathetic to saying oh, we should just believe in universalist values and abstract sort of, and I kind of think I agree with that, but it doesn't really feel very like people don't really people don't really go out and fight and die for like just abstract ideas with nothing else. You know what I mean? Like most movements have an uh, 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 maybe you know, the intellectuals in a movement will be preoccupied with the abstract and the universal, but the, but the kind of poetry of a movement will always have some identity component to it. And, uh, that's why I don't ever say all identity politics is crap or whatever, you know. You said, um, about dying for something. Do you think part of this comes from the fact that there is, there is nothing worth fighting or dying for in the last, say, 15 to 25 years? Um, amongst these communities at yeah. least I mean we're talking we're talking very hyper focused on certain communities in the west who have the ability to use social media which again keeps it a very small demographic mm. um, I don't really think so I mean it, it would be very depressing to conclude that you know we have to just have wars all the time because otherwise people will get bored and turn it turn into nazis <laughs> you know i hope that's not the case so like i hope that you know i i think it's it's not just that you know it's in it, the um one of the final like bits of of francis fukuyama's famous end of history is about um something like you know maybe boredom will restart history again you know so there is this idea that like you know we're we're so unused to living without that level of conflict that we would just start another one or, but, but I guess, uh, you know, there's some element of that there. I mean, there is some element of the idea that like, it's a time when, you know, um, uh, like as Tony Soprano said, I feel like I came in at the end of something, you know, like there is that sense that like, you know, all the really big ideas and the really interesting things are kind of over. I mean, actually, it's interesting, like I mentioned Mark Fisher a bit in the book. If you think about the stuff that was being written kind of before the rise of the alt-right, and which has totally changed everything, it's really, you know, we're, we're now back into quite a radical period um, uh, in politics. But before then, all the really smart people like Mark Fisher were writing about stasis. They were writing about the fact that we can't move forward. Nothing is happening. We can't. We can't imagine the future being different. You know, we have no vision of the future. All that kind of stuff. I mean, now uh, it's more like every, younger people are really radical again, and they, you know, in, e even when it's a horrifying vision of the future, it is nonetheless a different vision of the future, and it's, and th that end of history kind of stasis is totally over now. Do you think this whole thing goes in waves? So it would. We had Obama, we've suddenly had Trump, which is the logical one to zero. I mean, it's the binary opposite of someone like Obama. Do you think it's going to bounce back again? Um, 
I don't know. No. <laughs> I, I think. Don't I, think it's going to be a, med- a radical move back to the left. Uh, um, I think there will be in Britain, but um, uh, in America, it's very hard to say. I mean. Yeah, there could be actually. Yeah, it's very, very uh, possible. I mean, I could see something like if Bernie Sanders is not too old to run, you know, there's definitely an anti-establishment kind of lack of conservatism, if you like, in voting. Like people are willing to go and take a risk on something that sort of, uh, you know, couldn't have couldn't have been imagined before in in politics. Any other questions at all? Uh, Just here. Thank you. Um, I wanted to say thank you for your book, which was very timely and very thought-provoking. And I'm glad that somebody has written a thorough history of Gamergate so nobody ever has to look at it ever again. So thank you. (laughs) I feel that you've taken one for humanity in doing that. Um, I guess I wanted to take issue slightly, because you're right, you've been talking about how this moment of internet utopianism sort of devolved all of a sudden into nihilism. And I'd like to take issue with that slightly, because I think it ignores an important dynamic of what's going on. Because there are many strands which came out of IRC culture and came out and came out of 4chan, and what, one of which is a real political radicalism and a real sort of, whatever the equivalent is of a materialist analysis of the information culture we're, na- we're now in. Um, and I think that it's hard to talk about this without acknowledging the, um, the extent to which state repression really tried to stamp on that. You know, Aaron Swartz was hounded to his death. Mm. Um, Chelsea Manning, who is actually emblematic, just as a but as a side note, I think is emblematic of some of the reasons why um, anonymity is really important for progressive politics. Um, Chelsea Manning was sentenced to 35 years in prison and served seven of it before her sentence was commuted. Um, even Andrew Auenheimer, who I have no, who I hold no candle for at all, and is a disgusting individual, was a disgusting individual before he went to jail. But it took a long time. It took, you know, a year of, sol- you know, in a US prison, including periods of solitary confinement before he turned into a Nazi. He wasn't a Nazi before he went to prison. So um, I guess I should round on to a sort of question here, shouldn't I? Um, so I guess I would take issue in the idea that online culture and you know even sort of that chan culture is particularly or essentially um nihilistic i think that certain things which happened in that especially at 2012 to 2013 period really disenchanted people a lot if you look at you know sabu being being turned turned over and people realizing that they've been sold a pup in that way that had a really devastating psychological effect on people and actually made sort of online organize organization for contentious purposes very difficult so i just sort of add that as a mm. as so sorry the question so no, no okay i guess you, just your thoughts on yeah no i i actually don't um really disagree with that very much i mean uh that was never a political movement that i was like that I really related to or that I was involved in or anything like that. So to the extent that I know about it is very much as an outsider. Um, and, you know, because, you know, and, it, you know, generally it was quite libertarian, we'll say, right, like left libertarian or whatever, uh, which is something I've never been. So so it's not like um, it's not that I, I think it's a t- it was, a, you know, that the, there was nothing valuable in it or. Or something like that. I guess it's more like if I could go back and maybe rephrase or like um, write it again or something, I might be a little bit more uh, careful about saying, um, yeah, lot, there was a moment where something, lots of, you know, um, very, you know, brave people and lots of potential was there, but it was cut off very quickly, you know, and uh yeah, I mean, I was just like, I don't disagree with you, basically. Um, I think there was l- lots of good stuff there as well. Any other questions at all? This gentleman at the back with his hand up who was singing like a canary earlier. I'm going to start singing again. Oh, God, please don't. Noted. Um, some of the most visceral criticisms of your work and some of the most angry reactions came from the so-called progressive liberal online left who perceived that you were blaming them 
for the alt-right, that the alt-right was a direct reaction to their politics. So I'd like you to comment a little bit. To what extent you think that kind of Tumblr liberalism is a positive millennial expression of its own politic and to what extent it's in fact a destructive form of politics and how do you think we should view people of that political tribe? Um, I mean, I do think it's been very negative and divisive and I do take a pretty dim view of it because of just the things that I've seen. I mean, the the way that I, th- it's very, um, uh, you know, it has really um, uh, allowed a particular uh, culture that is very much about purging people, you know, uh, very obsessed with purity and, you know, um, being really, you know, just insanely intolerant of any kind of dissent. Uh, I watch that emerge and destroy organizations, you know, like no one on the right could ever hope to, you know. Um, uh, and, uh, and so I, I don't, I don't, I, I think it's been, you know, I think o- overwhelmingly it's been negative for political organizations and things like that. And also, you know, I think in the future, w- in the very near future, you know, somebody will write a very good book about, um, the, the toll that all of this culture war stuff has actually taken on people's mental health. Um, like, uh, I know so many people who, um, who had to, you know, just go like cut themselves off completely from, from the online world because they experienced, you know, they got to, they were, you know, they couldn't uh, help themselves, but kind of when they saw people being witch hunted, they had to step in and they, they couldn't stand the injustice of it. And then they ended up being on the receiving end of the witch hunting. And it like, you know, some people are, have a thick skin and can get through it, but for other people, it's, um, you know, really, you know, very difficult and very traumatizing. Um, And uh, so, you know, but at the same time, it's also a a style of politics that attracts very young people. Um, And actually, I have had people um, come up to me, like at one event, uh, a sort of notorious social justice warrior, if you like, came up to me and I was thinking, oh, God, oh, no, this is going to be terrible. And she came up and said, I really like the book. And um, I sort of used to uh, do all this stuff and, you know, constantly get people kicked out of things and uh, and purge people for, for th- thinking or saying the wrong thing. And now I would feel really bad about it. But like I was a teenager. <laughs> and uh, so that's going to happen as well. Like that generation are going to, you know, at some point... Uh, you know, when when your social world is is changed by just moving from college to, or school to work or whatever, like uh, will will change their their way of socializing, so it will all kind of disappear. Um, uh, well, it won't all disappear, but but you know, the I I I, I mean, people will grow out of it. That's terribly patronizing, but I think it's the case. I mean, what do you think those legitimate responses to this are? Should it be, should the onus be on the owners of the platform? So we're seeing, I think it was this morning, Twitter turned around and said, look, they're going to de-verify a whole bunch of alt-right accounts. Or should the onus be, again, on the individual? Should we disengage from social media? Only Tuesday in this venue, we had Jaron Lanier, the, the individual who coined the term virtual reality, who said, look, just get off these platforms. Mm. There's other ways to create community and the same with Douglas Rushkoff, who's, who's uh, we've had here as well, said exactly the same thing. Go back to the community, create localized communities of uh, differentiated individuals and, and realize that that's where you're going to get the most rich and human experiences. These, these machinic entities, these platforms, these behavioral modification empires are possibly the worst thing for us as biological uh, breathing bipedal entities. Uh, I, I, I was, so that kind of does make me think, though, of you know those funny like academic like, pieces that were written about um, people with Walkmans and like the the dystopian future where people w- would be just so destroyed by Walkmans that they wouldn't be able to have conversations with each other anymore, and everyone would be walking around with their headphones in, which is actually true. true like that yeah. bit has happened, but we can still have conversations. Um, so I don't want to be like. I hate the thought of being one of those people who just thinks 
you know, new technologies are scary and like, you know, they're going to ruin society and stuff like that. Um, uh, no, but because it's new, it doesn't make it right. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, that as yeah. well. I also don't want to be one of those people. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the, um, okay, the fact that, the fact that all of the, these platforms are owned by like, you know, two or three sort of global monopolies is, is c very scary for lots of different reasons. Um, sometimes I think, you know, sometimes I think, you know, being online is very fun and like, you know, you, you read all kinds of really interesting things and you see different perspectives and, and stuff like that. Other times I think, um, this is all actually really terrible because particularly with something like Twitter, which I'm, still on for some reason but i absolutely <laughs> hate it and uh i think it's you know I, I think it is just absolutely brought out the worst in people like it it it, it discourages the best traits and encourages the worst um uh, if you um you know so for example basically what you're supposed to do on twitter if you if you just go along with the with the pressure of the platform is basically just you know pick a side and then just kind of um become part of a little be like a little socialite in this little world and then just fling mud at some other people uh, who, you know, you disagree with on, on something. And, um, and it's, it's really funny, actually, if, you, if you're slightly brought into a little, in, you know, online tribe and then you say, oh, this article that I read, you know, by some conservative columnist says really good, you know, and they're all just like, oh, God, what, <laughs> what is this? You know, because the whole idea is, no, you're meant to pick a side, pick a team, and then just every day you just relentlessly, you know, snar snark at some common enemy th that gives you, g gives your group a sense of coherence. Mm -hmm. So every day we go online, we join our little group and we socialize with them and we, you know, show that they're our kind of tribe. And then we, um, we pick a hate figure and we collectively hate that person uh, like in 1984, we collectively hate together because it bonds us as a group. And uh, the, so that's why the thing I love to do most is to just share, uh, constantly share things from really diverse kind of uh, points of origin because like the reaction on Twitter is just like, you know, it's just like a bad smell in the room or something. Like you've just, you've committed some awful social faux pas by doing that, you know, Because but I like to do it because... It irritates me so much that the platform is, is just, uh, you know, just breeds this very intense intellectual conformism, uh, which I, I mean that 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 is so obviously a negative trait. Like I just don't know why, I don't know why Twitter is like socialized people into thinking that just being this totally boring dogmatic person who just reads one magazine is a good thing. Being schizophrenic is a is a virtue in the social media realm. Um, question just at the back here. Um. All right, thank you very much for a great uh, discussion, Angela. I just wanted to ask, I guess it's a more general question as I'm someone who thinks of themselves as being on the left, but maybe the old left. And we've talked a lot about a lot of stuff and uh, problems with online culture and stuff. But what about the problem on the left? I think, right, the problem is that a lot of the left, it hates normies. And this isn't just an American problem, this is a British problem, right? A lot of people on the left, a lot of the left don't like the working class. And that's the kind of <laughs> end of it. They don't like the way the working class raises their children. Oh my God, and you know what? They take their children to McDonald's. Jeez, how bad can you get you know maybe they might want to slap their children occasionally and this is all just not allowed they don't like the way that people vote okay maybe you think the eu is a problem you must be an absolute kind of racist etc 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 so i think that to me and this is something i've thought about a lot and i'm extremely worried about in terms of progressive politics but that has got to be the first question for us, anyone who thinks of themselves as on the left, right? How can we make a mass movement? And we're not going to be, we cannot do it anymore in the way we have been doing it, which is basically by saying, 
you know, working class people are beyond the pale. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, um, I guess, um, uh, okay. One of the, uh, the first problem is one of, uh, how we kind of define ourselves and how we find meaning in the world. So one of the things I was thinking about a lot when I was writing the book and why I based it on the kind of subcultures literature, which was like, you know, pre-internet kind of about music subcultures and stuff like that is that. I think that, you know, the mainstream has kind of been wiped out in a way. Uh, so one of the reasons that, you know, the that or one of the things that I noticed kind of early on before it became kind of undeniable the, that, that this was genuine, you know, that there was a genuine kind of far right or fascist movement like, you know, emerging from these kind of, um, you know, online spaces. Uh, I think that one of the things that happened is that the 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 Paul like 4chan people were able to trick the the mainstream media so often because the mainstream media doesn't want to be the mainstream media because being mainstream is so, such a terrible thing. Uh, you know, so the mainstream is constantly looking out to the margins and looking out to the subcultures and going, that's where all the interesting stuff must be happening because, you know, the mainstream by definition is crap. And can only be, you know, uh, it can only find anything good or imaginative if it's coming from the margins. But that is such a recent uh, way of thinking. Like, uh, again, just to use the granny example, like, you know, your grandparents didn't think that like that. I mean, wh where did they find meaning in their lives? They didn't have to say, you know, uh, d define themselves by being oppositional to the masses kind of, or being oppositional to anything mainstream. That's a, a very recent kind of, uh, phenomena. So, I mean, that would be the first thing I actually think, um, you know, gets slagged off, off a lot, but I actually think the TV show girls was like really, really good at, um, at showing kind of the point, the, the absurdity of where we've ended up, where we actually, you know, we're, we're trying to find meaning through well first of all work which is a total disaster uh, and people who try to find meaning through work are the least unionizable people in the world because they're like I'll do anything I'll do 20 internships you know um you know like the main character was kind of doing um so anyway before I, I I'm going off on a tangent there so the the one thing is the our our hatred of the the mainstream and of the masses which is you know, something that is John Kerry is um, documented is kind of a, a ha in a way a, has been with us since the beginning of mass culture itself. Uh, but but it used to take on in a way a kind of a elite or snobbish form. And now it takes on a more subcultural one, which is what Sarah Thornton, who I referenced in the book, was arguing. Basically, she was saying this isn't necessarily like subcultures are not necessarily, you know, progressive and wonderful. They're actually really elitist and exclusionary uh, by definition, almost. Um, so that's the that's one thing that means. And that's a pretty big one, because that's basically saying. People, we. Uh, or maybe a younger generation need to completely rethink uh, what gives meaning to life, basically, and like you, you know, need, the, the entire paradigm needs to go, kind of, um, uh, and and that other other things need to become meaningful again. Um, and you know, I, I generally totally agree, and. Um, uh, the, the only doubt, the only criticism I have sometimes of that kind of perspective, even when I'm arguing it out in my own head, because I, mo I mostly agree, um, is I think that there is one danger in that, which is that if you just say, um, you know, like, we like everyone just as they are, or, you know, you have to like everyone just as they are. I mean, that's in, is, is that not kind of like having low expectations of people, like in a way, do you know what I mean? Uh, so I just worry that, you know, like I, I think, uh, for example, um, uh, it, it's a real pity that, um, uh, one of the, the great kind of traditions of the left, one of my, my favorite things when you sort of read about, say, uh, you know, the Italian Communist Party or whatever, like the, uh, th that they really believed in kind of like ordinary people 
having access to high culture and uh, people who maybe didn't finish school being able to de argue with people who had, um, you know, were, were, you know, aristocratic practically, you know, and th that they, their idea was like, you have to have really high standards and like, you know, that, that, um, uh, um, nothing is too good for the working class kind of. So I would just worry that sometimes, I mean, yes, there is a problem with, uh, subcultural snobbishness that tends to come along with a very um, a, a left that doesn't think it's going to be in power uh, because then you're happy to be on the margins and you're kind of wallowing in like being a marginal force uh, but at the same time at the same time my only uh, my only kind of concern with that is that you should also hold people to the same high standards you would hold yourself to any other questions at all uh, Sam, just here, just in front of you, Murray. Um, people go on a lot about sort of like how the right had better memes, but isn't one aspect of the sort of rise of the alt right compared to the sort of increasing sort of, I don't know, demonization or sort of scare, sort of anti SJW backlash, the fact that the alt right are quite helpful people in that there's this alt right meme where it's essentially an SJW generic person saying, it's not my job to teach you. And then there's an alt-right neat. He's overweight. He's got like a bald patch. And he's like, oh, uh, you're interested in racial differences in IQ. Here are six peer-reviewed studies I found. Uh, would you like more information? And it's, it sort of goes on. And isn't there just sort of a sense that, you know, like, it's quite easy to like fall into the alt right, but like if you try and like become a new member of Twitter or something and become a member of the sort of Le sort of the alt left or I don't know the SJW dirtbag left or whatever it's kind of like there's a lot of like rituals to go through and you kind of have to really prove yourself in a way you don't with the other side I just wonder what you thought of that yeah I know that's absolutely true um I that is what like you know I mean one of the the um I think if you're interested in a movement and the the it, it, you know, the level of attraction to it that's out there, given how weird it is, is kind of surprising. The first thing you have to do is try to understand, like, why is this attractive to people? Right. And uh, unfortunately, like one of the reactions to the to the book is like when I tried to say, look, this is why it's attractive to people. They said, like, oh, you obviously, you know, you're, you're trying to flatter them or you're trying to say, oh, this is a really great movement. But uh, obviously, you know. There's, you know, there's no point. There's no point in treating it like it's some kind of um, random eruption of evil, sort of with no context and stuff like that. So you do have to understand why it's attractive, and that is absolutely one of the things. They're proselytizing, basically. The 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 kind of yes, I, I'm so like I always kind of cringe using the term, but like social justice warrior left or whatever is saying you better you, like you're out. If you, if you do one thing wrong, <laughs> we're going to kick you out. And like, you must, and it happens all the time. People, people who are like the most, um, you know, uh, the, the, the model pupil kind of, you know, getting everything right. And then one day they, you know, somebody finds their, um, their like, uh, a Tinder account and this, you know, the, they don't, the age range isn't right or something like that. That actually happened, which is why I brought it up. So the, <laughs> this guy was uh, uh, giving, me, giving me a hard time for not being woke, uh, ended up being booted out of his own, <laughs> of his own little online milieu when they found that the, the, the age range in his dating profile was too young, um, <laughs> uh, which, which did kind of make me think... Um, Sucks to be you right now, <laughs> uh, but uh, um, God, I've completely forgotten the question. Sorry. Oh yeah, yeah, the yeah, and so basically, of course, if you have one group of people who are saying, just give, just you know, if you come into our tent, you can say whatever you like, you can be funny, you never have to apologize for yourself, um, uh, and you know, we'll educate you and we'll show you lots of interesting things and. And and so one side is saying that, and the other side is saying we're going to destroy you if you do one thing wrong. So like it's obvious why that the um, the right would be more attractive in that environment. It, it feels like one badly phrased tweet, and this identity that you spent the last five to ten years constructing can be destroyed. And yeah, and, uh, you put everything on the line. Everything is at stake in that in that scenario. Yeah, 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 and. It, 
people's entire world collapses o- overnight kind of, you know. Um, I mean, that's why I always say, like, don't, you know, you are not safe just because you go on every day and, and you do the correct virtue signaling. Like, you are not safe. Like, one day, if you're walking home pissed from the pub or something and you say something wrong, like, you're gone, you know, and your whole social world is gone. It's all going to... And you're just a fool if you think that they can maintain this, you know. Um, but but if you but for the time that people do maintain it, it does also. I mean, this is another thing we have to understand why that is attractive um, to people. It does have massive payoff because you know if you go on say Twitter and you you know you make um, you virtue signal or you make a, a sort of snarky takedown of of some bad person, uh, you know. You, you will get retweeted and you will get attention and you will get, you know, all of this positive stuff coming back to you. And it's it's pathetic to even think about. It, but like, it is true that like, if you tweet something and it just sits there and and nobody, nobody uh, retweets, it does make you feel a bit sad for a minute. <laughs> and, uh, and of course it does, because we're social beings and we care about, but, you know, you should in a way be able to be totally independent minded and just say, I am right. I don't care if nobody retweets it. This is an interesting article. This is an, whatever it is like. <laughs> and uh, uh, but instead, you know, obviously, if, if um, you know, and I've seen that happen loads that people who are sort of like you know, aging celebrities or they used to be famous and they're not really famous anymore. And then they go on Twitter and they, um, they say something very virtuous and suddenly it's, it's like they're famous again, you know, and they get all of this kudos and all of this affection from all these younger people who think they're great. And like, you know, you can really see why that is something that people can't really let go of easily. And you, you have to keep chasing it and being like more and more pure. It, it feels to me that the design of the platforms themselves are set up to mechanomorphize human individuals to disconnect you from realizing there is a biological breathing human entity behind that avatar. And I think that's the saddest thing about the scenario in which we've entered uh, into 2017. Um, any other questions at all? There's one just behind you, Maria. Thank you. Um do you not think that, like, regardless of whether you're right or left in your politics, the tendency that people have, especially the sort of slightly older generation, to um, examine our generation as if we're some sort of separate species has um, led to a, um, a sort of tendency to retreat into online communities and it's an, and sort of an us and them mentality. So do you not do you, do you not see a connection between our consideration of the younger people as having totally different view? you mentioned the walkman thing earlier so obviously for you know centuries generations have you know had a go at the younger ones and you know said that they're they're you know rash or stupid and we've had a go at the older ones for saying that they're regressive and you know unwilling to change but now that we have this ability to ch- to exchange information and views instantaneously with people across the world do you not think that this tendency to um look at us in a sort of sociological experimental way put us in a petri dish do you not think that that has is potentially damaging you know antagonizing to both the right and the left Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, um, you know, it, it's true that millennials are written about in that way, the avocado toast and all that kind of stuff. Um, um, and the, you know, the, con- you know, there is this kind of constant, uh, uh, churning out of, of kind of like think pieces about millennials and what millennials are all about and stuff like that. But I don't know that that's necessarily really produced, anything like uh it, it's in the mix somewhere but i don't i don't think it's made um uh i i, I just wouldn't see the connection really you know I, I i don't think that i wouldn't see the causation there i wonder if it's got something to do with just bad parenting i've always wondered the reason for trump <laughs> No, look, I've always wondered if the reason for Trump was that America has massive daddy issues and that's the reason why 
they put him, you know, this ultra masculine pain in the ass into, into, no, but I, I wonder if it comes back to something more, you know, millennials are having a, we know around, no, around mental health, anxiety, depression, the, the reason why virtual futures exist and the reason why we sit across 25 years is there needs to be intergenerational thinking because the same shit happens every three to seven years. The platforms are slightly different, but culturally, it's the same sorts of discussions. You know, you, you talk about Nick Land in the book and stuff that was happening in the mid nineties. You know, we, we were seeing the same cyclical thing. And the fact that we don't talk intergenerationally is the reason we're making the same mistakes. The reason the millennials are so dismissive to other generations and the fact that we're giving them robots and sticking them into care homes, you know, rather than talking to them, engaging with them in a very human way, there's something tragically wrong and we're not looking after each other or not looking after the older generation so perhaps it needs to start with an interlocker between each other you know there's a real feeling amongst as you expressing this this feeling of alienation amongst millennial generations how do we talk to each other how do we just make sure we're all okay because we're moving forward into this future together and i got your back if you got mine buddy boy yeah all right and one more question this gentleman here. Hi, thank you very much for the discussion. I enjoyed it. Um, I had a question here. It's good to look someone in the eye when you talk to them. Uh, I had a question about the, um, the concept of uh, culture generally that's being sort of utilized a lot. Right, we hear references to mainstream or subcultures, mm -hmm. culture wars, and I'm wondering if um, there remains any content to this category, to this concept, or if it still has any explanatory power whatsoever. Because it seems that when we're using it, we're, we're referring to real, you know, real social relations and social processes um, in which sort of uh, relations between people are being sort of displaced. This is one part of the story. Displaced onto certain sort of uh, functional online technologies. And, you know, within that realm, within the socializations that are occurring there, you're getting things like the degradation of human perception. You're getting the replacement of uh, individuality with nominalism. Or you're getting this sort of general um, emaciation, let's say, of, of reflective thinking, to ticket thinking, as you described a moment ago. Now, these are all phenomena which, if you look, look at the, what the concept of culture is, is quite antithetical to culture, right? I mean, these are all things that point actually to the opposite of, of the content of culture historically, right, as a culturation. So I'm wondering if um, generally, does the category of culture or as a concept uh, you know, have any content or weight or is it utterly meaningless given the phenomena that we're witnessing and describing here? Well, can, you, can I just ask, what do you, when you say culture, uh, what, do you, what are you thinking of? What do you have in mind? How do you, how, like, just uh, define it? Or I mean, I would say anything that broadly includes the advancement of the capacities or faculties of human reflection, sensibility, perception, um, any of these, which seems to be going through a massive sort of um, yeah, qualitative degradation given, you know, the available uh, sort of platforms of social communication these days, right? N yeah. There's nothing cultural about it in that sense. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think most uh, people use the term culture in, in, um, in a more neutral, vague sort of way. But you're right, I mean, in terms of the... Um, uh, you know, it, it, its origin and its kind of um, proper usage, maybe. But, um, uh, you know, that's certainly the Im the very imprecise way that I would be using it in terms of, you know, describing uh, it in the context of culture wars and, and stuff like that. But I certainly would agree that, um, that it's not, um, that it doesn't, that what I'm describing doesn't have any of the positive qualities that you mention. Um, yeah. So, Angela, my, my final question is, is, look, how do we provide a different vision for the future and one that perhaps is based on a joint sense of purpose and, and one that delivers on that potential promise of material progress? Um, 
uh, elect Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> um, <laughs> Are you just uh, split the room? <laughs> uh, I, well, I mean, I think, uh, you know, um, re returning to or, you know, having already kind of, I think, pretty much learned the lesson that um, without any without forms of organization it uh weakens you you know weakens you collectively that you know people need to become more organized um in their collective interests um but um uh but in terms of the i mean that's just a broad economic and and social thing in terms of if you're asking me specifically about the online stuff uh, I do think there is probably a, a need to get offline to some extent. Uh, like, not, you don't have to, you know, be like um, a refusenik or whatever, but just like, um, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the sheer amount of time that it, it is taken up in people's, you know, imagination and kind of social world is is not good and uh and also all the other things i've described the 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 um the divisiveness the uh the tendency to obsess about very niche little online subcultures that, that have no real meaning or relevance to the outside world um and uh and also that you know, the toxic kind of stuff and the, the fact that it, and the intellectual conformism is the bit that really annoys me because I, I just think I cannot believe, I mean, I've kind of already said this, but I just want to say it again. I cannot believe that like whatever it is about the platform has brought us to a point where, you know, it is actually seen as a bad thing to even read ideas that are, that you don't already agree with. Um, that's, like why bother reading at all like uh, uh, and and uh and we are reading less because of it as well so these these are difficult issues and i, I hope it was just the beginning I, I recommend you do go and read um the book and i i think we should end this with uh, the question to ourselves as to why we should engage with the sorts of things that are driving us apart. We we all fundamentally know there's something fucking wrong with the way in which these platforms uh, control us to a degree and mediate our conversations. So why should we be so complacent? Perhaps it's time for us to go forward and embrace, encourage and engineer and also surround ourselves by differentiated voices. So I want to thank the Library Club for hosting us and to our volunteers for helping uh, film tonight and uh, Maria for, for running um, the microphone. And if you like what we do, uh, please support us on Patreon and find out more about Virtual Futures pretty much everywhere online. We're we're purely audience funded, we're scrappy as hell, but we're doing our best. And I want to end with this, which is how we end every single virtual futures, and it's with a warning. The future is always virtual, and some things that may seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not contingent on our capacity for prediction. Although, and on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable does come of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that this evening. Please uh, join me in thanking the incredible Angela Nagel. The bar is now open. <laughs> Thank you.